for coming out to UBC today. Thanks for coming out and uh, having a look at our uh, engineering physics program. My name is Andre Marziali. I'm a professor at UBC, uh, an entrepreneur, and uh, I'm the director of the engineering physics and have been for about 15 years, I think. We've been holding this event uh, for almost as long as I've been director. And, uh, and the reason we hold it uh, is because Engineering physics is not a commonly known program. So you may, uh, through parents or friends or what have you, or, or through the media, have been exposed to what a civil engineer does, uh, what an electrical engineer does, uh, mechanical engineer, what have you, software engineer. But engineering physics is, is a much smaller program than all schools have it. Uh, it is called different things in different schools, but it is uh, rather different from all those other things you've heard of. And we thought uh, it would be uh, worth our while to try to uh, let you know what the program is about and see if it's a possible match to what you want to do. I know uh, most of you uh, that are students in the audience are probably struggling with some difficult decisions, um, as I was. So I, I was a high school student here in North Vancouver, and uh, coming to 12th grade, I have to decide, you know, where am I gonna go to school for university? What am I gonna do, right? Um, you know, UBC is a great school. We're one of the top 30 or 40 in the world, uh, which I think is fantastic. So that's not hopefully too hard a decision for you, uh, but there's lots of good schools you can go to. But the other, maybe harder decision, if you like technology and science, and if you're here, I assume that uh, you really have some interest in those things, you have to make this decision. Science versus engineering. And, and I, have, I struggled with that because I, uh, I loved physics when I was in high school. I liked math, I liked physics. Uh, but I also liked building things and building model airplanes as a kid. Uh, when I got old enough uh, to go in a car, I started working on cars. And um, so I was like, you know, how do you blend those two things, right? And then, and then beyond that, one of the things I want to talk to you today as uh, students is really trying to look a little bit further forward in terms of strategy. Like I know you may want to pick a program based on uh, you know, what you are enjoying in high school, which is fine, uh, but maybe what you enjoy in university might be different from what you enjoy in high school, so you might want to look forward a little bit more. Uh, some, I know some students pick programs based on where their friends are going, which again, on a short-term uh, you know, decision-making strategy, that's great. Uh, Long-term strategy, maybe, that's maybe not, not necessarily the best. So what I'd like to do is you know, try to help you make some of these decisions um, but looking a little bit down the road as, as to what you might really enjoy. So hopefully you can go to university and whether it's engineering, physics, or, or something completely different, you take a program that you enjoy and you come out of that and, and take on a career that you also enjoy and you're fulfilled by. And that, that's really the ultimate goal, right? So, you know, looking at science and engineering, thankfully there's a lot of overlap. So if you're interested in both of these things, a lot of the things you can do as an engineer, you can do as a scientist and vice versa. Um, they do have some slightly different slants, right? Science, historically, has been around discovering things, discovering how our world works, discovering, you know, what makes up the insides of a cell, how does the universe work, how did it start, what is matter made of, uh, things like that. And, and uh, those of you standing in the back of the way, feel free, to, there's a couple seats open, and I don't mind if you walk down through the front, uh, whatever you like. Um, make yourself comfortable, because I'll be talking for at least three hours. <laughs> so that's that's the realm of science, right? It's, it's it's all the famous scientists you know have sort of discovered and uncovered theories underneath how things work uh, around us. The realm of engineering uh, is more recent, and it's really about making things. It's about making the products that you use every day, from your car to your cell phone to ultimately even apps and, and software. So, you can love technology and really struggle between these two things. And, and one of the things I'm hoping to help you do today is figure out you know, sort of how, you, how you manage that. And uh, the real silver lining in this um, around engineering physics is you can do both. Right, so that's actually what made me pick engineering physics. So I studied this program, UBC Engineering Physics. I enrolled in 84, just after high school. And the reason I enrolled is because I love uh, 
physics and math and I love building things. And I saw a brochure that my brother brought home from UBC around this engineering physics program, which was really part of science, part of the engineering. And I said, yeah, that's great. I don't have to pick between those two things. And the reality is I've never picked. Like my career has evolved through my life and I've done a few things, but even as a professor, I've done some really hardcore science and then gone all the way to the other end and done some you know, real engineering and company formation and a mix of science and engineering throughout. And I keep bouncing back and forth. And it's an incredibly empowering thing to be able to do that, right? To just follow your interests. And if the meander into science, follow into science if they go to engineering and follow them. So that's what engineering and physics is, right? At an academic level, it's effectively an honors physics degree plus an engineering degree. But because of this massive overlap between the subjects that you need to learn in science and the subjects you learn in engineering, we can put all that together in a five-year program, which is about the same as the other engineering programs uh, with co-op, which I'll get to in a second. Um, what you get, though, from, from engineering physics is this really powerful combination of underlying analytics, right? So understanding math and physics, being able to solve difficult analytical problems, and developing that kind of problem-solving intuition that you need when you go to solve difficult engineering problems, right? But you don't just have that. On top of that, you have the engineering skills that you need to translate ideas and inventions into real-world products. And that combination, I think, is exceptionally powerful. And one of the things it does, it can give you tools to solve um, really unsolved problems, right? I mean, think about it for a second. Engineering is often a discipline where you take known science, known engineering, and you apply it to a new thing that you're making, whether it's a you know, new circuit board in the cell phone, uh, a new piece of car suspension, or something where you're just applying things that are already known. Science is often about the unknown, and engineering physics is around doing engineering on things that have not already been solved. Now, one of the reasons it's important, of course, is a lot of the problems that, that we're facing as a society um, are obviously unsolved and will require, I think, pretty deep thinking and very interdisciplinary approaches to really come to a solution. And this is not just engineering, by the way. Um, engineering, I think, touches almost all of these problems. Analytical thinking touches all of them, for sure. Right. So whether you end up as an engineer, as a scientist, or as a policymaker, as a politician, as a lawyer, whatever you might do, um, having world-class problem-solving skills will help you no matter what you do. And I think we'll need all those disciplines to try to tackle the number of problems I'm showing here, all of which are going to be absolutely critical in the generation beyond. So I know a lot of students come into engineering physics because they have ideas around, okay, I want to do something impactful for the environment. I want to do something impactful in machine learning, in artificial intelligence. I want to explore space, whatever it might be. Okay. And knowing they're going to get the skills they need to then head off in that direction uh, after the program. One of the most common questions I get from first year engineers they are trying to decide what to, what to go on to, and they, they've already picked engineering, is what, what makes engineering physics different from electrical or from mechanical engineering and so forth. And my answer to that is, fun, is this, right? Engineering is called applied science. We're in the fact of applied science. It's applied science because it's applications of science to developing products, right? So a civil engineer will build a building based on science that's already been worked out. They don't have to start from scratch. A mechanical engineer will develop, like I said, a, you know, a piece of a car or something, or an HVAC system, or, or something more complex, uh, but based on science that's well understood. They mostly have to look things up and so forth. And, and I don't mean to be unkind to those professions, Okay, because they can be excellent professions, and you can do research in those professions, but usually that requires getting a PhD in engineering after your undergraduate degree. Whereas engineering physics is the one engineering discipline we have on campus that fundamentally trains people to be research engineers. Right? And by research, just so I'm not misunderstood by the young people in the audience, because I know sometimes the teachers in high school will call it this, research is not sending you to the library to read books. Right? I know my kids have said, you know, that's, that's Oh, research. research is, is working in a lab with a bunch of other people trying to solve a problem that's never been solved. It doesn't even have to be fundamental science. It can be engineering research. Right? Just, you, don't, you don't know how to do this. Um, so in engineering physics, right, you get to sort of think about underlying ideas, coming up with new ideas, maybe coming up with new science. 
but you then have the skills to translate that into real products. And that's a discipline that historically, people that do that, we've called inventors, right? And as I see engineering physics, we're training inventors. People like to come up with new ideas in science and translate them into engineering. And it's actually not an accident that the inventors you'd recognize today, whether it's Elon Musk or, or probably less well-known, but uh, maybe even more impactful than Berger's Lee, who just invented the internet. Um, they were trained in physics. Right? So why do you have to be trained in physics to come up with Tesla, for example? And my view of that, and I obviously haven't asked Elon Musk this, but my view of that is understanding physics gives you fundamental intuition in how things work in a way that lets you uh, triage ideas you may have very quickly and home in on ones that might actually work. So I've spent the last you know, 13 years uh, with Dylan and Beatty uh, building about a tech company. It's pretty rare that we would actually go to a board, to a whiteboard, and solve physics equations. But it was incredibly common for us to go to a whiteboard and think about issues of scale, issues of diffusion, thermal conductivity, and do order of magnitude estimates to figure out if things were possible or they were not. So the intuition that we had around physics helped us build products that were actually needed for medicine. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And I'm convinced that that sort of intuition is what leads people like Elon Musk to say, okay, this is the right thing to do. And then of course he hires a bunch of people that, that can go off and do it. So let me talk a little bit about, about the company we started. So uh, Boreal Genomics, um, and, and I'm gonna use this as an example because I think it's a fantastic uh, data point on how you can translate science into a useful product okay, and how engineering physics plays a role in that. So at, at Boreal, we started Boreal Genomics out of my research lab um, here at UBC. So as a professor, um, I had a lab uh, in the physics building where we investigated anything from uh, bio-nanotechnology, we did a little bit of engineering for the Genome Center and the genome community in town. So I, I, I was cross-trained in that, just so I guess I should do an introduction. I, I, I did um, engineering physics here at UBC. I went on to do a PhD in physics at Stanford and then stayed. And my PhD, by the way, was in particle accelerator physics. So designing particle accelerators. And uh, I switched from that into the Human Genome Project and went to work in the biochemistry department at Stanford building robots and machines for sequencing uh, DNA. Came back to UBC and started a lab in that space. So during that time, actually, uh, I had a, um, a coffee conversation with Lauren Whitehead, one of my colleagues here at UBC, who was working on electronic paper, uh, so you know, flexible displays. And he wanted to move ink molecules around with electric field. I was playing with moving DNA around with electric fields. And putting our two heads together, we figured out, hey, we can do something special with DNA and electric fields. And at that point, I recruited uh, Dylan and five other people, no, four other um, ex-students that were working for me in my lab, either doing their PhDs or working as research engineers. And together, we started Boreal. They were all trained in engineering physics. What we did at Boreal is we eventually came up uh, with the instrument that's actually sitting outside, right? That is uh, the core of a blood test for detecting cancer. It's not where we started. We started off in, in forensics and biodefense and sort of you know worked our way towards this, but we eventually figured out a way to concentrate DNA, uh, preferentially um, if it had mutations that signaled it came from a cancer cell. Uh, in fact, I don't know if this video will play. Yeah, there you go. That with those two, that red and green band that you see separating and, and the other fluorescence is actually the cartridge that you see outside. Those two bands, uh, the green band contains DNA that came from a tumor cell, the red band contains DNA that came from a, from a healthy cell. They differ by one letter in the genetic code. And then you can see how effectively you can separate them. No one else could do this at the time or has been able to do this since. Uh, to get that million fold plus level of separation we could achieve. Um, but how did we get there, right? We started with this. And you don't need to understand the details. <laughs> the high school students ought to be able to spot at least a trick of identities. Okay? There's a couple of double angle identities and, and so forth. Um, but just to say, this is this is where we started. We started with some first year calculus, a little bit of high school trig identity stuff, and some knowledge of electric fields, and realized that if we if we set up electric fields that did that. Uh, we could concentrate DNA. And you'd never come up with that without the math and physics. 
Like we didn't know that was the shape of electric fields, that we have to have one rotating twice as fast as the other, right? I mean, but that's that's the beauty of math is like sometimes the results of that come out of a simple mathematical argument. You say, hey, wait a second, DNA behaves this nonlinear way in electric fields. What happens if we apply oscillating fields? Oh, look, we can concentrate and we can do this. Right? That's science. That's really science. That's not engineering. But what the six of us did that we're all engineers, is then got together, and after a year's work of work in my lab to sort of figure out some of the details around this, we literally got together in, in one of our basements and built three prototypes to concentrate DNA, and that's how we started Boreal Genomics. You can, Dylan's there, the guy in the gray shirt is Dylan, many years ago. That's 2007, probably. 2007. Yeah. Um, Dylan, Joel, Peter, Jason in the back. Jason went off to work for Google X, after founding Boreal, uh, Peter is with Color Genomics. Uh, I can't remember where he sent it up. He's with Twist now. Oh, a Twist, right, of course, a breaking predator. Um, but uh, anyways, that, that, that was literally the evening where we made pizza, got a bottle of wine, and, and sit and assemble instruments in, in our colleague David's basement. Uh, that's me soldering uh, in the corner when I was substantially younger. Um, but point being is because we were all trained in engineering physics, we could go from that fundamental physics into actual product development. Like, we designed those circuit boards. We, you know, Dylan's really responsible for all the mechanical design and leading the engineering team that built that instrument outside. And the number of engineering issues that we solved was immense. Okay, we were handling, to move the DNA around, we had to have uh, voltages upwards of 1,000 volts. Some difficult electronics going into that. Humans are going to interact with it. Oh, and there's salty water involved. Right, so 1,000 volts, human being and salty water is not a great combination. Uh, so there was a ton of very, very careful uh, control of current, interlocking, and also uh, being able to shut down current if something bad happened. Um, but then, of course, we've got a thousand volts in a system where you need to conduct heat, because things would heat up in the gel where we had the DNA, and we didn't want the gel to heat up and melt, right? So how many materials can you name off the top of your head that conduct heat but are electrical insulators? That's a terrible combination, right? Because metals conduct heat and conduct electricity. Right. Plastics are good electrical insulator, but they don't conduct heat very well. Anyway, so we have problems like that to deal with. Diamond is the right material, by the way. So then you get into cost problems. You can't make a thing out of diamond. Um, we end up using very, very thin glass. It's the closest thing we could end up with. Um, but that was one of about a thousand problems we had to deal with uh, around the engineering on this. Right? How do you get high current, high voltage into liquid without burning up electrodes? Right? We end up with graphite. How do you get um, electricity onto graphite in a way that doesn't grow in the presence of salty water, uh, that was expensive, we ended up with platinum. Don't, do not take the springs out of the machine that works without <laughs> um, Anyways, lots and lots of engineering challenges, but we had the background to solve them. So eventually, uh, we built the company, we had it funded, we developed this cancer blood test, we did clinical trials, we've since actually sold all of that technology, including the on-target instrument, uh, to another company that's looking to miniaturize it, and we've gone on and invented additional technology for broader applications within genomics, uh, and that's what we're working on now. Um, this is not that uncommon a story. Okay, now engineering physics, I don't want to deceive you, and I should say, by the way, all through this, and, and my students will know this well, I'm incredibly biased for this program. I love the program. I loved it as an undergrad. I loved uh, my classmates at the time, the atmosphere, or the instruction we got, the project lab. And one of the reasons I came back to Vancouver from the Bay Area was because I wanted to be involved in this program. I wouldn't have come back to do anything else. Um, having said that, so be aware, to, you know, take everything I say in the context that, that I love what I do. Um, but if I look back at my graduating class of about 25, 28 of us back in 89, uh, we're 60 a year in InchBiz now, we were smaller back then. I think at least five or six of us ended up uh, starting our own companies and being entrepreneurs. So Engineers is not an entrepreneurship program. We also had people that went off, like myself, and, and became professors of physics. Um, I know one of us went to med school afterwards, is now a doctor of the cancer agency here. And um, you know, someone went on and did law. There's a lot of careers that came up and a lot of options. I'll talk about that separately. But one of the things that I realized is, is in the history of the program, a lot of our graduates ended up in leadership positions. And even if they didn't start companies, they were somehow managing people. So one of the things I've tried to focus on in the last decade or so is to try to take the program and focus as much as possible on developing leadership traits and 
adding content in the program to do that. The math that we studied today in the program is the same math that I studied in the A's. That hasn't changed. The physics is pretty much the same, with maybe one or two new courses. Right? The engineering has evolved. We have way more project courses than we used. There's lots of hands-on learning, which we, we all understand now to be the, the best way to train people quickly. Is more of an apprenticeship model where you work with mentors and develop things. But the really new things we've developed have been around uh, technology leadership. So communication skills, right? Managing a team, working with other people, right? Uh, leadership skills. So incredibly, we're really working on the skills that, that those of you that are, are parents in the audience will understand are the actual skills that make you successful at work, right? We all learn stuff in our undergrad degrees, and when we go to the workplace, what makes you successful, right? It's how well you can work with people, and how well you can lead people, and, and, and so forth. So empathy, being able to listen, all these things become incredibly important, and have historically not really been taught in university. And we're kind of pioneering that a little bit. I've actually taken on um, using the Search Inside Yourself course from Google um, to, uh, to bring that content into our second year program. So as soon as students come into engineering physics, we actually start with things like mindfulness meditation, empathic listening exercises. Right? I mean, we're also doing physics and engineering, but we're spending some fraction of our time now trying to get our students to the point where they can work well in teams and eventually manage teams. Uh, those of you in, in high school here, if you have a chance to get a hold of that other book on this slide called Designing Your Life, that's out of the Stanford Design School. And it's a couple of engineering profs that wrote this book with the intent of uh, applying engineering design principles to people's lives and figuring out what you're going to do. Um, I've gone through that book and done the exercises in it. It is mind-blowing in terms of how eye-opening it is with respect to your careers. Um, I have career decisions to make all the time, despite being where I am in my career. Uh, you obviously have to as well. If you have a chance of getting hold of that book, I would do it and work through the exercises. Probably one of the things that will help you the most in trying to select what you do after your high school. Um, but bottom line, all the, um, all the projects we do are team-based. And we have one in every year of the program now. We start off with a competition robotics course. We saw some of the robots in the lunchroom. Uh, we, start, we then have a, a machine learning course, uh, also based on teams, and then we have two courses that Dylan runs out of the Engineering Physics Project Lab. Uh, they're also team-based and now really developing projects, uh, sometimes for industry or, or otherwise, um, uh, for people's own, own uh, enterprises. In all those courses, we, we work hard to get people to be comfortable presenting to audiences, anything from uh, investors to lay audiences. In, in the course that I teach in second year, uh, in term one, I have students give a pitch to investors, so learning how to deliver content concisely and accurately and, and enthusiastically. And in the summer, uh, we do an exercise where we have students give a, like a mini TED talk, so something meant for a more lay audience, right? So trying to train everyone to communicate both to people that are experts in an area versus uh, ones that may be uh, new to them. The uh, community around the program is, is actually one of the things that I hear from students is the reason they come to EngViz. Uh, it is a phenomenal community. It's one of the great pleasures of my life that I get to work with these students. I, I would never ever abandon this job. Um, it's just, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, this, this is a great group of people. Uh, we, um, we do everything we can to foster that community. One of the things we started doing is a, uh, a second year mentoring program. Now, if you haven't heard it already, I'll tell you because you'll hear it. Uh, EngFizz is known pretty much as the hardest program UBC offers. It is challenging, it's a lot of work. A science uh, degree typically has five courses per term. Engineering physics typically has seven. So in, in science, you graduate with 120 credits. Engineering physics is 175. Okay, I don't mean to scare you away, but it's a hard program, it's a lot of work. Uh, and for some people, uh, it's made worse by the fact that a lot of the courses are, are based heavily in, in math, in math and physics. Uh, if you're good at math and physics, right, or willing to work hard in that area and you don't test it, um, that's maybe not so bad. If you did test math and physics, this is probably not good. Now, coming into the program for first year engineering is a huge jump. 
So the first sermon I introduced, I remember that term, and, and I, I went from hanging out with my friends every night in the first year to working, studying 24-7 the second year. And to try to help students through that transition, we've created a, a mentoring program where we group our incoming students in groups of six, and we assign them two third-year students and a senior students as mentors to have uh, effectively social events, uh, roughly once a week or once every couple of weeks in the first term of the program. And to try to help them connect people they can go to for help, connect them to me as well. I join them for some of these things. And, uh, and hope that they integrate into our community in a way where no one gets left alone. So one of the things I'm passionate about is once students come into the program, I don't want to leave anyone behind. If we screen pretty heavily to get students in, but once they're in, I want them to pass everything and make it through. I'm so happy to say it, I just checked marks on the current second years. Um, not a single second year student failed a course. For the second year running, actually, this was also true last year. Now, that's not been the case historically. Right? Students used to drop out of the program quite frequently in, in the first term, and I'm happy that that's improved a lot. Um, I think partly for some of things. You know, the, the community, uh, in part, I think, I, I got this email from a student that obviously didn't lead the name, but I had one of her students uh, Email me, uh, uh, this must be from last year or, or the year before. Uh, they, they've gotten into some difficult situations, and I don't remember if it was personal, family, or school, or whatever the gap yeah, problem was, but the, the student was in a bit of crisis. Uh, emailed me for help, but at the same time, uh, emailed the engineering physics students in general, and, and, and then sent me this email, which I think characterizes our community. Right? Uh, so the student was just astounded, I mean, you can probably read it from where you're sitting, but astounded by the level of support um, that, um, I'm trying to be confidential and avoiding gender, but the student got from, from the classmates. And, and that, that's how this is, and you can see it outside, right? I mean, you know, I sent an email out once a year saying, hey, we're gonna do a high school info session on Sunday, can people come out and help? And you can see how many people turned up, we're not paying them, they don't really get anything for doing this. They're just happy to help. It's, a, it's an amazing community, and so I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. If you talk to them, you'll, you'll, you'll understand. So in terms of the actual training, um, I'm not going to get into the math and the physics. Obviously, like I said, we've got math in the program all the way up to math 400, 406. So, so courses that only you know, a math student would normally take. Engineers do not take those courses. A lot of science students don't take those courses. So we're really heavy in math because it's one of the fundamental skills we want to send you out with and one of the ones that I've benefited from, really understanding deep, deep down analytics, right, to solve, solve all those hard problems. Uh, same with physics, we do all, everything up to quantum mechanics and, and relativistic ENM, electricity and magnetism, uh, classical mechanics, statistical physics, everything you need for a physics degree. So like myself, a lot of students can, can graduate from the program and go straight on to a physics PhD, if that's what they want to do. Um, and we're well trained, by the way, and again, Tooting the program's hard, maybe in, in my own in this case inadvertently, but when I got to Stanford, right? So I went to the Stanford PhD in physics program, not applied physics. So with students coming out of Caltech and Harvard and all the other schools that you'd recognize, and we all had to write qualifying exams. I had the second high, highest mark on the qualifying exam. Okay, so I wasn't missing any training because I went through the engineering program, right? Um, so I had everything I needed to do well there. So. so as I said, there we're like, we've got everything you need to go on in that area. What surprises people, I think, is the extent to which we have hands-on courses in this program. Because I think that there's a misconception about engineering physics um, in, our, in our own engineering community that it's very theoretical, right? So they see the math and the physics and they're like, oh, this is more of a theoretical engineering course. We have as many design um, hours in engineering and physics uh, as any of the other engineering programs. In fact, we have more because we're a slightly longer program. And we use some very, very high-tech tools. I mean, we had a benefit of support from the government. Years ago, you don't BC and the, and, and the provincial government gave us almost a million and a quarter dollars to build infrastructure and prototyping, and, and one of the sites ended up uh, in our building. Uh, so the, the students have access to real world-class prototyping equipment and can build ridiculous things, right? I mean, some of them are here. Uh, the giant racing robot was not built here. Uh, but it's one of our graduates that took an idea and kept it going after he graduated, building a giant racing robot that he rides in. Um, yeah, uh, so look it up on YouTube. It's called Prestige, it's the anti-robot. Anyways. Um, 
But uh, I, just to give you a sense of what our students do, and you see it with the robots, I do want to show you a very short video. This uh, looks easy. From our second year robot food course. Water or extra clothing? Uh, this student, by the way, ended up uh, ah! being a, either a founder, I think it was a founder of a uh, uh, probably tech company as well, but I'm on the board of now. Yes, he has no extra food, well. water, or clothing.
we, we, as, as far as I know, we're still the only school that offers this at the underground level, where we hand students sheets of metal and say, here's a machine shop, go build, right? Now, now it's more exotic materials than just metal. We have laser cutters, we have 3D printers, right? Uh, we have a water jet cutter. That'll, you, know, you can make a drawing of something, basically print it into metal or stone or anything you want. It'll cut up from two inches of granite if you want. Uh, some pretty amazing machines. Uh, one of the cool things about engineering and physics, because we're not the only ones that have these machines. Uh, other departments here have them. But we bought them with funds that said specifically these machines are for use by undergraduate students. So unlike other departments where the faculty members and graduate students have, have priority on these machines, our students have priority on them as undergrads. So in the summer, those machines are basically First, our students get to use them, then anybody else. Well, we're this course. Um, we've extended that to a very new course that, that uh, Meadey runs. He's in the other room uh, with the machine learning robots. Uh, this was the very first year we ran a virtual machine learning competition where students have to design machine learning code that would learn how to drive autonomously, recognize parked cars and their license plates. It was like kind of UBC parking, um, avoiding pedestrians. This was walking sideways. Uh, we'll eventually move this into hardware, but not have the students build the hardware. So this is a course where we want the students to focus strictly on the software and artificial intelligence. So that's now a third year course. And then from there, we go on to the fourth and fifth year courses that Dylan uh, and Media and Bernard collectively uh, operate and, and, and direct. And those are courses where students can work on real industry problems. So Dylan uh, works with the local industry community uh, who then suggests or, or has you know, unsolved problems that they would like to solve. Uh, when they're hard enough, they usually don't have the bandwidth to necessarily go after them. So they suggest them to Dylan, Dylan proposes to the students, and the students then work on some of these problems. And a few of them you've seen, uh, seen around the room. Uh, fantastic experience. A lot of students will then get uh, permanent employment with some of the companies that they, uh, they work on these projects with. Um, other students will then uh, off, you know, select their own projects to work on uh, and maybe go after entrepreneurial directions. So we, I actually, a few months ago, I went through my LinkedIn profile and tried to find graduates of the program that are connected to me and seeing what their roles were and look up their history. It took, it took me a few hours to go through this, but we found about 50 companies that have been started by our graduates, employing about 3,500 people. That, that's a phenomenal record for such a tiny program. Um, like I said, not strictly entrepreneurship, but it's, it's been a, an interesting offshoot of the breadth of the program, I think, is one of the reasons that we have so much of that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on, on, the, on the, the core of the program. You can go on the UBC calendar and look at all the courses that we offer, or, or that you have to take within engineering physics. There's a physics math course. We're, we're pretty hardware-centric, right? Like you're going to go through a program and really learn how to design and electrical and mechanical and real engineering. But you, there is also software, uh, and the good news is there's technical electrics in the program that you can take in almost anything. You can go in business direction if you want. In fact, there's a commerce minor. There's an entrepreneurship minor you can take. You can do a math minor. Uh, you can do a science minor, which we don't advise because we're already half a science program. Um, but this, you can pick your own direction. Uh, in, in a way that's actually has more freedom than some of the other programs. And we gain all of this, by the way, by having an extra academic term. So uh, this will be hard for you to read, but you can get this on the UBC calendar. Engineering is five years, whether you do co-op or not. Now, co-op is a program that's run by the university in a special office called the co-op office that integrates industry work terms with school. So if you come into engineering physics, in September you go, you come into classes, I'll be teaching one course, that HMS 259. Uh, exams in December, and then in January you go up to industry to work, and you work until April, and then in May you come back to school and do that robotics course that I just showed you the video from. Right? And then you go back to school again in September, back in January, and then you have eight months where you can go to work in industry, and a lot of people will then go abroad. Uh, we have an international exchange program, you can do a school term abroad if you want. And if you come back from one term of school, one more term of industry work, or academic research work, you can be in an academic lab, one year of school and you graduate. Now, this is an important distinction between engineers and some of the other engineering programs. If you do electrical or mechanical or civil engineering, you can do it in four years. But if you do their co-op program, it's five years as well. The big difference that allows us to, to squeeze this in is we have one more school term, one less co-op term. So we have nine academic terms which means that you cannot do it in four years. 
So it has to be done in five years. Whereas the other part will have a choice of four or five years to build those blocks. The other important distinction, because we think a lot of the learning that happens as an undergraduate happens when you go to the workplace and, and, and you find out what you like doing, what you don't like doing, and, and so forth. Um, so co-op for us is integral to the program. You don't have to do it, but all our students do. So all of our students are in co-op, and we have room for all our students in co-op. In the other engineering programs, they only have room for about half of their students. Not their fault, they're much bigger programs. They have 200 students instead of 60, right? But um, that's a big distinction with engineering physics. Uh, more fun enrollment facts. We take on about 8% of all students in engineering, so there's about 1,000 students in engineering, we take 60, right? About 6%, but more like 900 over 60. Um, 80% of, uh, last time I looked at this, the top five students went into engineering and physics. So we do tend to capture the very, very good students. The, the, they're sort of self-selecting for the program, right? Students that are very strong and first should tend to come to engineering and physics, probably for the challenge, partly. Uh, you know, if they're that good in physics and math, they get a lot of benefits from the program uh, without having to suffer uh, too much as they go through it. Um, now, one of the beautiful things uh, is that we've recovered from some very dark years where almost all the students were male. As Dylan likes to say, there were more students in his class named John than were female students. Um, that is, I'm glad to say, no longer true. We're, as you can see by our volunteers out there, actually, uh, we have a, a pretty broad uh, diversity in gender now. And um, so we hit a high in 2018, and I actually suspect this year will be even higher. Uh, based on the, the forecasting trends that we're doing. So uh, if you're a, a young uh, female engineer to be, uh, don't be frightened, you will be other girls in the program. So what do you do with the program? And no, you know, back to, to talking about strategy for life and, and, and going on, uh, there's a lot of things that you can do when you graduate. And this is the double-edged sword of engineering physics. It's wonderful to have choice, and for some students, it's a challenge. They might go, I, you know, there's so many things I can do, what do I do? Um, the good thing to know, and I'll, I'll send this as a message to all of you students in the audience, you can't ever go wrong. I know, and, I, and I see, I've, I've got three kids, right, and they're kind of at this stage, well, two of them are well beyond this now, but um, of having to pick careers and make decisions and work, and you can always do different things. You, you take on, you do an undergrad degree, you work for a bit you don't like, you can always go back to school and do another one. Or go back to school and do a master's degree, do an MBA, get into business, whatever, wherever it might be. Um, one of our uh, colleagues in, in Boreal Genomics uh, did an undergraduate in biochemistry and then thought, huh, I actually want to build things. Came to re enroll, did an undergraduate in mechanical engineering, came to me, did a PhD in my lab in physics, in biophysics, and then went to Delft to do a postdoc in nanotechnology, at which point I snapped him up. I was like, come work. So incredibly broad the trip. And he's, he's been phenomenal. He's, he was actually, so where, where Dylan was running the team that developed the hardware that you see out there for Boreal Genomics, this person, Matt, uh, developed all the chemistry that ran on and all the assays and the actual cancer testing. So you can always change direction. Don't, don't panic that you might take the wrong program in school. Okay, you can always, you can always change. Having said all that, so what do you do after engineering physics? Uh, probably a third to a half of our students go work in engineering. They'll go to work for firms like Google and Tesla and, and, and what have you, right? Uh, local firms like Misty West and Starfish Medical uh, that might actually do more hardware development. Uh, those are actually, they're, they're founded by engineering physics graduates and hire a lot of engineering physics people. Um, you can start or run it like that company. As I mentioned, there's a lot of entrepreneurship uh, in engineering physics. A lot of our students graduate and start companies. If you look around the high-tech companies in town, like I said, you know, General Fusion, um, you know, D-Wave has a ton of physicists was started by a physicist, actually, but I know there's a lot of engineering physics people there. Uh, Misty West was started by two of our students in engineering physics. Starfish Medical was started by one of my classmates in engineering physics. Pro Silica was started by one of my classmates. Um, there, there's, there's a ton of companies out there that have engineering physics people at the helm. In weird positions, actually, uh, what's the company, Stem Cell. Uh, until until he left last year uh, to go to a company in Absara that's run by one of my ex-students in engineering physics. Uh, their CFO, their chief financial officer, was engineering physics. So uh, a lot of that, that's why I was saying about the leadership potential in engineering physics, and we really try to emphasize that in the program now because so many of our graduates end up in that space. So. so
So there's that potential. You can go on, of course, and do, do research in academia, right? You can, you can follow the science path after engineering physics, right? You, so you, that's kind of what I embarked on initially when I went to grad school and then changed tack and went back to more engineering work. But you can certainly go and become a professor and do, and do science research. Um, and you can work in, in, you know, sometimes you may have to spend a year catching up on some courses, but if you want to go to law school, med school, or what have you, all those options are open. I've seen some people go to Emily Carr School of Art after engineering physics. Uh, when my classmates did that, uh, interesting profession afterwards. Um, anyways, lots, lots, lots of options.